Thanks everyone for coming out Sunday afternoon in Spanish for Utah. Everything is inspired by the teachings of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the founder and charity of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Om Aginati Maranda Syangana Minasakas Chaksavirungi Jamyana Tashmai Sri Guru Vira Maha Sri Chaitanya Marama Bistam Shapitam Yana Bhutta Mayam Rupa Kadam Yam Dharati Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Rama Hari Rama Rama Hari Hari We're getting some of that alliteration in for the title today, Saved to Serve. Unfortunately, the world we see today is full of people who are not using the gifts that God has given them. The great poet Robert Frost put it this way, the world is full of willing people. There is a small minority of people willing to work, and there's a large majority of people willing to let them. Imagine a country such as ours with a population of 220 million people. Now, 84 million people are over the age of 60. That leaves 136 million to do the work. People under the age of 20 is 95 million. That leaves 41 million to do the work. There are 22 million employed by the federal government that do nothing. So that leaves 19 million to do the work. Four million are in the armed forces, which leaves 15 million to do the work. Deduct the number of people who work in city and state offices, 14,800,000, and that leaves 200,000 people to do the work. There are 188,000 people in hospitals or mental asylums. That leaves 12,000 people to do the work. Now there are 11,998 people in jail. So that just leaves you and me. <laughs> and frankly, brother, I'm tired of doing everything myself. <laughs> On a typical Sunday, which is the day of worship, there are priests, rabbis, pastors who look out over their congregations and temples, churches and mosques. And they see an army of potential soldiers who could be out there on the battlefield, but instead they're asleep in the pews. Our message today is that we have not been saved. We have not been blessed and gift, gifted with transcendental knowledge just to soak up spiritual truth. We've been saved. And the result that's expected is to use that knowledge to then activate your service. Now, even in a physiological sense, to maintain bodily health, it's been proven that you have to use up more calories than you take in every day. If you consume more calories than you burn, you're gonna gain weight, get lazy and lethargic, suffer in your health. Healthy life, successful life, productive life is about giving out more than you take in. Think of the tremendous selfless effort of a parent to raise a child. And that's only with the aim that that child will in their turn become a parent and serve their children in the same way. Think about the effort of a teacher towards his student. What amazing, unbelievable input. Similarly, Prabhupada our spiritual master, at great effort in the autumnal years of his life, as you know, he didn't even come to the West until he was 70 years old. He invested in us, who in the 70s were his young students. He created ISKCON, an international society for Krishna consciousness, with the end that we become mighty servants that as he took ground for the kingdom, we will carry on that tradition, accept the baton from him, and continue to take ground from the kingdom. Indeed, when Prabhupada, by the time Prabhupada left the planet in 1977, he founded 108 temples, and today there are 820 
temples all over the world. And how did that happen? It's because we served more than we sat. Now you're sitting, you're listening, you're absorbing, and that's absolutely essential to give a spiritual foundation and to make you spiritually strong. But those spiritual calories that you're getting right now, they are meant to be expended in mighty acts of service and sacrifice. If you see your role as a devotee, as just to take in, take in, take in, you're gonna become like that overweight person. You'll be like the child or the student who repays the parent or the teacher not at all. In other words, too much in and not enough out. Prabhupada says in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the individual soul is forever a servant of God. The constitutional position, the dharma, the intrinsic nature of the living being, something which cannot change, is that we are servants. In the same way that the dharma, the nature of chili is to be hot, the nature of sugar is to be sweet, the nature of water is to be liquid, none of us can avoid serving. It's our nature. And when we step into the middle of our nature and elevate service to the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that is called LDS. Loving devotional service. I thought some of you would like that. After hearing the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of God, for only one half an hour, Arjuna threw off his lethargy, he threw off his confusion, his depression, his despondency, and he enthusiastically fought a battle that lasted for no less than 18 days. That was the result of his having sit, sat and heard for half an hour he launched himself into the great Kurukshetra war. Prabhupada, our spiritual master, met his spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta, in 1926. The entire meeting didn't last more than a half an hour, during which his spiritual master told him, in two minutes, you are a young, intelligent man, you speak English, you should preach the gospel of Bhagavad Gita and Krishna consciousness in the Western cultures. And based on that Sitting and hearing for two, mu two minutes, Prabhupada dedicated the next 60 years of his life to doing exactly that, fulfilling the orders of his spiritual master. And we've all experienced that if you love someone, the expression of that love is service. Service with mind, body, wealth, and words. And the more that you serve the beloved, the more the beloved is going to reciprocate with you. Krishna says exactly this in the 11th verse, fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Yeya tam mam prabhajate tam stataiva bhajami aham mam avartmana manusha parta sarva shaham. He says, I reward those accordingly to the level of service and surrender to me. Question. Do you know people, or maybe you are even one of them, who downplay their abilities, downplay their talents? Oh, I'm not that gifted. I don't want to have what it takes. I'm just average, ordinary. Now, they have God-given dreams, but they never act upon them. They're afraid of exertion, afraid of failure, afraid of criticism. They never discover their talents and abilities because they're afraid to step out in faith. Imagine a baby, every baby we know, instinctually they have the ability to walk. But imagine a baby who's tried to take a few steps, fallen down on his bum, gotten a little bit hurt and a little bit disappointed, and then just gave up. Just gave up on the whole process of walking. Do you know people like that who have stepped out for their dreams, had a setback, had a disappointment, had a criticism, and immediately they threw in the towel, gave it up, put their dreams on a shelf where they're still gathering dust. I don't have what it takes. I'm not that important. 
If you ever get the idea that you as an individual are not important to God or to yourself or to your family or to your generation or the work of God, here's a little bit of grist for the mill. One voter in each precinct in the United States will determine the president of the United States. Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, and Rutherford B. Hayes were all elected president of the United States by one vote of the Electrical College. California, Idaho, Oregon, Texas, and Washington achieved statehood by one vote of Congress. The Draft Act of World War II passed the House of Representatives by one vote. So your one vote is important, and as your vote is important, your spiritual gift is important as well. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. Now in America, we take the right to vote for granted. But if we don't exercise that right, we'll find us ourselves in a situation where we'll be living in a country where that right is no longer available. In other words, to have a God-given gift and to not exercise that gift, to have the opportunity to serve the creator of the universe and not take full advantage of that opportunity is to be no better off than to neither have the gift nor have the opportunity itself. Prabhupada says we are struggling because we have deliberately rejected our Supreme Father and we want to become independent and unaccountable. Our message today is that it's more painful to live a life of unfulfilled desires, a life of self-pity, than it is to pursue our dreams. Life is going to be full of pain, no matter what. But isn't the pain of climbing the upward path the pain of pursuing your faith, your God-given dreams, isn't that going to be more rewarding than the pain of knowing that what you could have become, but you never tried for it. You never stepped out in faith. Bottom line is, would you rather live an exceptional life or would you rather live an excuse-filled life? Teddy Roosevelt. It's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasm, great devotion? Who spends him or herself in a worthy cause? Who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory or defeat. We all know that if you don't use certain organs in the body, what happens? They atrophy. In Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, the waters are so deep and dark that the fish in those waters they have eye sockets, but they have no eyes. The reason is that living in continual darkness has caused their eyes to disappear because there's no function that the eyes can perform in pitch black, deep water darkness. Now what is true of the eyes of those fish can also be true of the gifts and abilities that Krishna or God has given us. We can get by in life without any vision, without any enthusiasm, without exercising our physical or mental selves. We can spend most of our time, most of our energy, making excuses, complaining, accusing God of not equipping us with abilities, shortchanging us, passing us by. But the problem is not a lack of abilities. We have plenty of those. The problem is a lack of willpower. 
Krishna, God did not create us for mediocrity. The problem is not that we have no abilities, but that we have abilities that are immeasurable. We are sons and daughters. The Almighty Lord we call to do great things, anoint to make our mark in the world. Don't run and hide from your destiny. Don't be afraid. Krishna has given you abilities that will match your opportunities. Strength to shoulder your responsibilities. In the 22nd verse 9 chapter, the way, Ananyas chintayantumam yejana tesham nitubhirtum yoga sema bahami ham. Krishna says, to those who worship me with devotion, meditate on my transcendental form. To them, I carry what they lack and preserve what they have. If you know the Ramayana, and the story of Hanuman, Hanuman's right on the altar there at the feet of Lord Ram. Hanuman, when, the, when, when he had to jump 800 miles up to, over the ocean to find Sita in Lanka, he became very, very big. And once having arrived at Lanka, he needed to be invisible. He needed to spy and not be detected. So at that point, he became very small, like a cat. So when Hanuman needed to be small, Krishna empowered him to be small. When Hanuman needed to be big, Krishna let him be big. Hanuman Ji, son of the wind, lord of the monkeys, Rama's best friend, you eliminate illusion to destroy all sin. Champion of truth with the thunderbolt body, the mighty monkey god who embodies bhakti. You're the breath of Shakti and you achieve victory like the movie Rocky. Hanuman, you have the power to be small as a cat, tall as a tower. You devour lust, ignorance, envy, and greed. You succeed and never cower in the hour of need. You left to Lanka to reassure Sita. Don't worry about a thing because Rama is going to free you. You burn down Lanka when your tail is on fire. And to serve Lord Ram is your only desire. Ram's little brother was about to die. Without a second thought, you began to fly, searching for a cure high in the Himalayas. And when you weren't sure which herb to take him, homie, you brought the whole mountain back with one hand. You embody bhakti, the yoga of love, and that's why Ram gave you a great big old hug. Along those same lines, you might be familiar with this quote by Marianne Williamson. Our deepest fear... It's not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It is our light and not our darkness that frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You're a child of God. We're all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that's in us. And it's not in just some of us. It's in each and every one of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Now here's something to think about. The reason why many people don't want to acknowledge their talents and abilities is because they don't want to acknowledge an omnipotent creator who gifted them, who endowed them, who equipped them, who empowered them, who loves them, and who would like to see them moving towards their destiny. It is said that with abilities come opportunities, and with opportunities come responsibilities. Now. If you're one of the many that doesn't want to accept responsibility, what are you going to do? You're going to backtrack and deny ability. Aren't you? Poor old me. I just don't have what it takes. I got shortchanged. Prabhupada says, It is Krishna, God's desire, that we meet together under the banner of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, pool our resources and abilities and cooperate to accept responsibility. That's also an ability, right? Responsibility for pushing forward the Krishna conscious movement, which is so badly needed throughout the world. Now, second to responsibility is 
accountability. There's an old Japanese proverb about a man who died and went to heaven. Heaven was full of beautiful, lush gardens and glittering mansions. But then the man came to this warehouse, which was lined with shelves. And on the shelves were stacked piles and piles and piles of human ears. A heavenly guide explained that these belong to all the people on earth who listen each week to the word of God, but never acted on God's teachings. Their worship never resulted in action. And when these people died, only their ears went to heaven. <laughs> who has your ears? That's also an ability that's called receptability. But who has your heart? That's account ability. Who's working in you and through you? God, does he just have your ear or does he have your heart as well? Prabhupada said that when we chant, we should chant heartfeltedly. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Accountability, evaluation is always a combination Good news and bad news. Well, this is what you did. Why did you do it? What did you do? How far did you go? How far much, how much further do you have to go? What was the gain? What was the loss? What was the upside? What was the downside? What was the profit? What was the expenditure? Would you agree with me that in this area, it's just a question of good and bad news? I read a cartoon once exhibiting this principle in a church setting. In this particular church, the good news was, described and communicated to the congregation, that we baptized four new persons down by the riverside. The bad news is we lost two more in the swift river current. <laughs> the good news is that our church sent their pastor on a trip to the Holy Land. The bad news is that we just gave them a one-way ticket. <laughs> The good news is that the church's women's softball team won their first game. The bad news is that they beat the men's church softball team. <laughs> the good news is that we've outgrown our space here. I'm sorry, the bad news is that we've grown, outgrown our space here. The good news is that we have plenty of money to build a new worship hall. The bad news is that it's still in your pockets. <laughs> it's not necessarily how much you do that matters to Krishna. It's what you do with what you have that matters to Krishna. Krishna is not concerned whether you have much ability, whether you have star status, or whether you have little ability, whether you have great talent or small talent whether you're an Indianapolis race car with sizzle or whether you're just an SUV in suburbia. What matters to Krishna is what you do with the talent that he gave you. You're not accountable to Krishna for being the best, but you are accountable to Krishna for doing your best. They said, if you can't be a highway, be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. It isn't by size that you'll win or fail. Be the best, whatever you are. And success is not a matter of temporal gain. It's not a matter of recognition or adulation or popular acclaim. Success is just a matter of doing the best you can with the talents and abilities and opportunities that God sends your way. It is said that your talent is God's gift to you and what you do with it that's your gift back to God. Real devotion is most often seen in small things more than in big things. It is said you can do great things, but no less important is to do small things in a great way. And what's wrong with most people? Is they're too good for the small things. They're too good. Oh, somebody else can pick up the trash. I shouldn't have to do that. They're too good. 
They're not too good to set down and be served the prasadam, but they're too good to serve the prasadam itself. They're too good to return the shopping cart in its stall in the parking lot. They're too good to get to work on time. They want to dispense with the small things and get on with the big things. They think they're too good for the small things. <clears throat> they can't be bothered by them. Longfellow once wrote, most people would succeed if they were not troubled with big ambition. I heard about a joke. A young fellow was talking to a big, tall, strong Paul Bunyan strapping sort of a fellow. And this young fellow said, if I were as big and tall, strong as you, I would go out into the woods, find the biggest bear I could find, and I would wrestle him to the ground. The tall man looked at the little man and said, there are plenty of little bears in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Another and our last ability is availability. Story man applied for a job as a handyman. The employer asked him, can you do carpentry? The man is answered in the negative. How about bricklaying? No, don't know bricklaying. What about electrical work? Yeah, I don't know anything about that either. Finally, the employer said, prospective employer said, well then tell me what's handy about you? And the man said, I live just around the corner. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the greatest ability we can have is availability to be where God can call us, to be within whisper range of his summons, to be always tuned into his will. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. The Lord has called and equipped every one of us to be a servant. And he's gifted every servant with the ability to work for his glory. It was said of Prabhupada, he built a house in which the whole world can live. So any house, any construction, it needs equipment drivers, drywall installers, electricians, it needs framers, it needs people to build it, people to maintain it, it needs cooks, it needs organizers, it needs yoga teachers, it needs child care, it needs flower garland makers, it needs artists, it needs public speakers, it needs musicians, graphic artists, auto mechanics, on and on and on. The Lord wants you not only to join, but he doesn't want you to do in a lackluster way, in a lukewarm way. He wants you to be ambitious, to be a vital, vibrant part of the Worldwide International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Now, ambition is taken nowadays to be almost a dirty word, but there's nothing wrong with ambition as long as it's dedicated in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and for uplifting our fellow men. In fact, the derivation of the word ambition, it means literally to go around. What it means is to be in movement, to be in orbit around the opportunities that Krishna or God has sent our ways. There's a saying that sums it up perfectly. We ought to expect great things from God and we ought to attempt great things for God. So summing up here, success is when you act with responsibility accountability and availability to take full and robust advantage of every opportunity that Krishna has given you for his glory and for his honor. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Our encouragement is to make the decision with me today to live an exceptional life rather than an excuse-filled life. To make the decision to choose passion over indifference, to choose effort over laziness, devotion over selfishness, in essence, light over darkness. We are children of the Almighty God, full of beauty, full of power, full of brilliance. We are created as eternal, luminous beings. We're created to shine in light and love in this life and in the next life to go back to home. 
back to God. That sounds good to you, or any part of it. Raise your hands along with me. We can all say it together. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Now you're welcome to stand up and Jai Krishna will lead us in some good chanting.
Yeah, bro.